inga waka inga awa inga manga o te matu tēnā koutou, tēnā hui hui tātou katoa. Tēnā koutou i roto inga mihi ki a kingi tuhetia. Nā reira, e rau rangatira mā, inga homahi o te whare wānanga, e te whakamenenga. Nā mai, whakatau mai, tēnā koutou katoa. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Neil Quigley, I'm the Vice-Chancellor. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to uh, this evening's uh, professorial lecture to be given by Professor Conrad Pilrich. Professorial lectures are designed to allow our newly appointed uh, or promoted professors uh, to share their research uh, interests uh, with all of their colleagues and with members of the community. In this case, <coughs> the lecture marks Professor Conrad Pilditch's promotion to professor in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Conrad has a Bachelor of Science in Zoology and a Master of Science in Marine Science from the University of Otago and completed his doctorate in Oceanography at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia in Canada in 1998. Conrad has been with the Faculty of Science and Engineering since his appointment to the School of Biological Sciences in 1996, lecturing primarily in the area of marine ecology and oceanography, and contributing to undergraduate courses in environmental science and ecology. His research interests lie pr primarily in benthic oceanography and ecology, focusing on the processes that influence the structure and function of soft sediment communities. Specifically, he's interested in how hydrodynamics and benthic organisms interact to affect sediment transport, recruitment, nutrient fluxes, and food supply. Together with his colleagues and students, Conrad has conducted research in a wide range of environments ranging from intertidal to the deep sea, a reflection of the extensive occurrence of soft sediment habitats. He's part of the science team for the New Zealand Government's National Science Challenge Sustainable Seas, has been a long-serving elected council member of the New Zealand Maritime Sciences Society, and is a member of the American Society for Limnology and Oceanography and the Oceanography Society. Conrad maintains that an active uh, research lab has supervised more than 30 masters and PhD students published more than 250 peer-reviewed research articles and conference presentations, uh, and is an independent expert advisor to several regional council-led working groups and government agencies. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, will you please join me in welcoming to the lectern to deliver his inaugural professorial lecture, Professor Conrad Pilditch. Quickly, um, Deputy Vice Chancellor Alistair Jones, this is Chad Hewitt, Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering. And friends and family, thank you for coming along tonight on um, the shortest day of the year, and I promise this will not be the longest lecture of the year. Um, so, uh, in the, about the last couple of weeks, I've fielded a lot of uh, interest about the title to my talk, The Ecology of Marine Sediments Why Soft Bottoms Matter. So, all will be revealed tonight. So what actually sparked this, uh, this um, idea for the title of this talk was a cartoon that I found uh, when looking through the New Yorker. And it depicts um, a group of ladies sitting around having tea. And one says to the other, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. And so having spent nearly 20 years studying the bottom of the ocean, I was a little bit perturbed by this because these systems are important and they do have value and we should care about them. So that's going to be the topic of, of my talk today. So if we take a little less human view of the world, we'll see that most of our planet is blue. The Pacific Ocean that we see up here covers about a third of the surface of the globe. The oceans themselves cover nearly 75%. So three quarters of the surface of our planet is covered by oceans and water. And on those, deep, on those seabeds, lie the sediments that have washed off the continents, composed from the skeletal remains of the animals in the ocean, and it is by far the single largest, most ubiquitous habitat on the planet. So it's important. So no matter where you go, there are soft sediments everywhere. If you go from the Antarctic 
region and the soft sediment communities there. Very, very diverse community of shellfish, starfish, and animals that inhabit the sediment. To the tropical oceans, the dugongs feeding here on the, uh, on the seagrass communities. Soft sediments are everywhere. The deep sea environments, down here at several thousand metres, these lovely crinoids and, uh, that are there on the seabed. And into our coastal habitats in the intertidal areas where we most contact with. So the soft sediments that lie beneath our oceans are everywhere. They harbour probably the most of the undiscovered biodiversity on the planet and they carry out important functions. But why don't people care about the soft bed? It's because they don't link the processes in those sediments to what they value from the coastal systems. So if you value as part of your ecosystem, clean water for swimming in coastal habitats, productive fisheries, being able to go out and catch snapper, enjoy watching seabirds, or gathering kaimawana, then you should be interested about what's happening in these soft sediment communities. Because the processes that are occurring in there, the interactions between the animals and plants, underpin the things that we value from these ecosystems. But it wasn't always like this. If we go back to what the seabed looked like some 540 million years ago, it was a very, very different story. In the Garden of Edikara, we had microbial mats that dominated the sediments. These thick mats, made up of microbial communities, capped off the sediment. There was no exchange of water, there was very little exchange of nutrients between the sediments and the overlying water column. The only animals grazing these communities were surface grazers, mat scratchers, lifting off the microbial mats that formed them. It's a very toxic environment. There's a lot of hydrogen sulfide produced by these bacterial mats. That's the rotten egg smell that you get um, in muddy sediments. It's very poisonous to animals that need oxygen. Then 540 million years ago, things began to change. There was an explosion of biodiversity occurring in these sediments, and it was driven by the advent of predation. So other animals moving across the sediment surface, eating these map scratchers, drove the evolution of a community that began, to, that began to burrow into these sediments. And that changed everything. As Soon as these microbial mats were broken down and the burrowing activity of these animals began to function, exchange could occur between them, a water column and the sediments. The sediments became oxygenated and that fundamentally changed the bacteria that live in these sediments and the processes that they mediate. So a lot of what we look at today is dependent on the processes occurring in these sediments. And this happened 540 million years ago. So if we move and fast forward to today's seabed, it's a very different story. The species have changed, they've evolved into things that we're familiar with, shellfish, worms and crustaceans that burrow into these sediments but they're still carrying out a very, very similar role. They're introducing oxygen into these sediments, they're affecting the microbial communities that are there, and they have a fundamental role in how these systems function and the connectivity to the overlying water column. So this is gonna be about as complicated as my talk gets tonight, I hope, and there's just a couple of things I want you to remember from this. Firstly, that the sediments and the water column are intimately mixed. You can't think about the water column in shallow coastal environments without thinking about the processes that are occurring in the sediments. What happens in the sediments, in these coastal sediments, is that organic matter, dead plant material, dead animals settle down to these sediments. The microbial communities in these sediments break down this dead and decaying organic matter. And by doing so, they release essential nutrients that support the primary production in the water column and in the sediment, the plant community that everything depends on. So these sediments, because a, these sediments regenerate the nutrients that fuel the production. And in coastal environments, about 80% of the nutrients needed to sustain the plants have come out of the sediments and into the water column. So what, the activity of what happens in these sediments supports the primary production which the rest of the food web depends upon. There's also another key feature about these sediments. They have a very special biogeochemistry. In the surface layers, there's oxygen present. Not so fast. Oops, now of course I'm into this internal dooley. How do I go back? Here we go. They have oxygen present in these surface layers. 
and in these deeper layers, there's an absence of oxygen. And this special biogeochemistry facilitates microbial communities that have, the, that have the capacity to remove excess nutrients, in particular nitrogen. So nitrogen in a bioavailable form stimulates plant production. If there's too much nitrogen, you get too much plant production and you lead towards eutrophication and massive algal blooms. But the communities in the sediment have a capacity and a resilience to burn off some of that nitrogen. And it depends on maintaining this oxic layer and this anoxic layer very close to each other to allow the bacteria to remove some of this bioavailable nitrogen that fuels primary production and convert it into nitrogen gas, which is inert and unavailable. So these sediments carry out an intricate processing of dead organic matter, releasing nutrients that fuel production, but also have the capacity to shift a little bit off to the side and burn some of it off as unavailable nitrogen. And this is, provides resilience against excess nutrient load. So I guess what drives me and what makes me want to study science, well I've always been interested in how things work. And I want to know how these animals are intricately linked to their environment and how these processes are changing the supply of nutrients to the water column or burning off some of these excess nutrients. I also want to know if we're losing animals from the sediments and we're in the midst of a global uh, biodiversity crisis at the moment where species are becoming extinct at rates that have never been seen before since a meteorite smashed into the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs, that is, of course. But we're losing these species. So what are the consequences of the species loss or changes in biodiversity to how these soft sediment systems function? Remember, their functionality is critical to the things that we value from these coastal habitats. So this is, these kinds of questions are very, very important in a changing landscape and a changing world. And we're seeing things change over long periods of time and over very quick periods of time. So globally, the two largest stresses in the coastal ocean are sediments and nutrients. And New Zealand's really, really good at delivering lots of sediments into the coastal coastal environment. We occupy about 0.05% of the land area on the globe, but we contribute over 2% of the terrestrially dry sediments into the coastal habitat. Now part of that is related to geography. We're in a westerly wind belt that delivers a lot of rain. Part of it's due to geology. We have mountainous regions and volcanic soils which erode very readily. And part of it's due to the narrow long shape of New Zealand, which means when it rains, there's very short, steep catchments which deliver sediments to the coast soon after it's rained. There's no lakes to track that. So this represents, but humans have greatly accelerated those rates of delivery. In 200 years, we've seen our landscape change in Northland from forests, Kauri forests and Kahikatea forests to a predominantly pastoral landscape and urban areas as well. So these factors, these changes in land use have greatly accelerated a natural process and delivered lots and lots of sediments into the system. And these sediments cause stress on the soft sediment communities. And I'll talk about how that works in a minute. The other big stressor, of course, is the bigger increase in intensification of agriculture, happening globally as we want more meat production. And in New Zealand, we've seen a trebling of cow densities, for example, over the last 20 years or so. We need more nutrients, more fertilisers to support the grass, to feed the cows, and we're starting to see some of the deterioration in our lakes and rivers associated with this intensification. Those sediments, those nutrients, are on their way to the coast. And in systems where the integrity of the sediments has been compromised and the ability to process nutrients has been lost, leads to state changes in very undesirable outcomes. This photograph that you see in the bottom right is of Kendal, which was where the Olympic, Beijing Olympic yachting venue was. Very, very large macroalgal bloom associated with the excess nutrients that are coming into the system. So how do I go about doing the research? Well, there's two main approaches that have sort of driven um, how we've worked over the last 15 years or so. One is about understanding the natural history. Okay? What do animals do? How do they behave? How do they function? What role are they playing in these systems? Through understanding 
what these animals are doing in the sediment, how they're altering the oxygen conditions, how they're processing the nutrients, gives us more information on what we can think about if we lose that species from the system. The other key aspect to what I do is empirical field research. This means going outside and working in natural environments. So what I want to do today with the rest of the talk is give you three examples of the type of research that we've been conducting over the last sort of five or six years or so as kind of benchmarks for the different sorts of work, that, the research that we do and why it's important. So the three examples are changing functional role of species, muddy waters, and then why biodiversity is important to resilience. So the first work is some work that Hazel Needham did as a PhD student working with me and colleagues at NIWA, looking at the functional role of crabs. Everyone knows what a crab is. You go to the estuary, they bite your toes, you run away screaming, but they form burrows. This is Ostrahelis crassa, and it's a common mud crab. Go to a sandy beach, go to a muddy estuary, these will be very, very numerous. So what Ostrahelis crassa does, or the burrow and mud crab, is it forms burrows, as you might expect. And you can see the evidence of these burrows on the sand flat. So what Hazel did as part of her research was spent a summer pouring surfboard resin wax down holes to see what the architecture of those burrows were underneath the sediment. And this was an example of one of the burrows she ex excavated from Tyra Estuary. An incredibly complex, interlinked series of butter burrows that extended over tens of centimetres in width and down to about 30 centimetres depth in the sediment. This is the lungs of the sediment. It increases the surface area. These burrows are irrigated, bringing in fresh water and oxygen, and that's stimulating the microbial communities to turn over and regenerate those nutrients faster and faster. So we thought, great, crabs, burrow builders, Bob the burrow builder. And this is the role that they're assigned in just about every study that we look at them. Crab forms a burrow through a burrow builder. They carry out certain functions. But what we're able to do is have a look at what happens in sandy sediments. And when the burrows form in sandy sediments, they collapse after a time. They just fall in on themselves, they're not consolidated, and these burrows persist for maybe a day or so. In muddy sediments, these intricately linked burrows persist for weeks, for months at a time. So the species form is doing a very, very different role as you move from a muddy sediment, cohesive sticky mud up to your knees, to a nice sandy sediment where you can walk across the sand land and not sink in very much at all. And in the muddy sediments, they're forming these burrow builders. In the sandier sediments, they're mixing the sediments down to five or six centimetres, continually forming burrows and collapsing. We're able to show that it had real important differences for the role that the crab was playing in terms of how this fed back into the primary production and how this fed back into nutrients. This kind of research is important because a lot of research now is assessing functional diversity. What the animals do in sediments, and they assume they carry out a certain role, and if they're present, it comes with that certain functions. Now if the role of this animal in the environment is changing, then those assumptions are all wrong in how we manage biodiversity. The second study I want to talk a little bit, and it's related to the last one because it's about muddying the waters. We've talked about sediment inputs as a stressor, and after every time it rains, sorry this isn't particularly clear, but the rivers become muddy and it delivers fine silt clay to our coastal habitat. Eventually this settles to the bottom and is incorporated into the sediment. Over time, if we deliver enough mud, the estuary shifts from sand flats into mud flats. And you've all experienced that if you're walking along, suddenly you hit a muddy patch, you're up to your knees in mud, very smelly, hard to get out, and then you're onto the sand plants again. In a future world where we continue to pump in large amounts of sediments into our coastal habitat, we will shift estuaries from sand, clean sand flat environments into muddier habitats. So what might this future world look like? So obviously we can't move forward 50 years, 100 years of, of poor land management practice to find out, but we can substitute space for time. We can go into our existing estuaries and work along sedimentary gradients where it's muddy and where it's sandy and look at what happens. So what does happen? If we have a look at these two graphs here, and I promise this is as, as numerate as I'm going to get today, across the bottom is mud content from 0 to 30%. Hard sand to up to your knees in mud. That's the gradient, okay? And I've plotted two measures of diversity of animals that live in the sediment. 
One is the number of species, and the other is how many do we have. And the take home message for this is, as we increase mud content, the diversity, the number of macrofaunal species, the number of species churning up the sediment and doing things and processing nutrients declines. The abundance of those animals also declines. So as we move to a future world with more mud, we're going to have less diversity of species and we're going to have less numbers of species in this sediment as well. So what does this mean for ecosystem function? Will the ecosystems function the same? Will we get the same amount of primary production that sports the shellfish, that sports the snapper that we like to catch? Well, unfortunately not. This is two measures of, of, of ecosystem function from this particular study. Again, we've got our same gradient of very low mud content to our gooey, sticky mud on the sand flats. And on the left-hand graph is a measure of nutrient processing. This is the inorganic nutrients that are coming out of the sediment into the water column that's fueling the plants. And what do we see? We see a steady decline in nutrient processing capacity. There's less nutrients available to support the primary production. And in the second graph here, we've got our mud content gradient again, we've got a measure of how much primary production is occurring in the sediments. This is by the microscopic plants that live right on the sediment surface. And these microscopic plants in coastal environments in the sediments provide about 80 to 90 percent of the primary production for the animals that are in these estuarine habitats. And what do we see? We see a strong decline in the amount of primary production associated with this increase in mud content. This is in part due to the loss of species as mud increases. It's in part due to the changing characteristics of the sediment where they become less permeable and things don't move across the sediment water interface in the same way. So, future world with lots of mud could be a very different place to what we have today. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is some very, very recent work around biodiversity and um, resilience. And this is related uh, to some work currently underway with colleagues at NIWA and, and the University of Auckland. So in this top graph, the top picture we're looking at here is a stretch of the Kuiper sand flat. Now the Kuiper just north of Auckland on the west coast is the largest estuary in the southern hemisphere. Apart from the land use changes, it's still in relatively pristine condition. So this is a, what looks like a relatively homogeneous sand flat. There doesn't appear to be much change going on across it. It's about a kilometre and a half uh, between the high tide mark and the low tide mark. But if we go out there and map and find out what species are present in the sediment, we get a very, very different picture. So what we're looking at here is a cross section across the beach, starting here and heading towards the ocean. This is a kilometre, and then it's 300 metres wide. So we went out, and benthic ecology involves taking a lot of cores, a lot of sieving, and a lot of idea. But what we observed, and the darker the colours in this heat map, represents an increase in abundance. Okay, so there's some 112 species on the sand flat, which about 40 of them are important to processing nutrients. They mix sediments, they create burrows, they pump water down into the sediments and do things that oxygenate sediments and stimulate microbial communities. So you can see there's areas on the shore that have high abundance of these nutrient processing species. Those black dots represent the number of species that we have. So the larger the black dot, the more nutrient processing species we have, the darker the colour, the more numbers of these species we have. So as we can see, this nutrient processing capacity across the sand flat is not uniform. There's hot spots of activity potentially because there's more nutrient processing species of higher diversity. So our question is, if we stress the system, what happens? If we're going into a future world where we're adding more and more nutrients to these systems, how does the system respond? What happens in the system? Does the diversity in the system provide resilience? to change? Can we maintain nutrient processing by stressing the system if we've got a diverse and healthy community? So the way in which we did this, and a lot of my research as the students and collaborators will know involves buckets and spades, we went out onto the sand flat at these 28 sites marked by those white squares and we carried out a manipulative field experiment. We added fertiliser to the sediments and we added it at two dose rates. We added a little bit of fertiliser and then we added a lot. Okay? We set it up before Christmas and we came back several months later. And we're interested in a measure of nutrient processing capacity. And this measure 
is related to how well the sediments are denitrifying nitrogen. Basically taking that bioavailable nitrogen through into nitrogen gas that can't be used by the plant community. By the plant community. And this is critical. For an inter-eutrophied system, if the seabed can convert those excess nutrients into nitrogen gas, we can invert Quandau and macroalgal blooms. So what did we find? Well, when we added a little bit of nutrients, the whole story came down to one species. And it's this species here, Macamona liliana. Many of you will have seen it. It's the wedge shell that's very, very common in the estuaries. It grows up to 2 to 3 centimetres in size, and it lives about 10 to 15 centimetres at depth. If you walk it across the sand flat and you see what looks like bird footprints, these are the feeding activities of this particular animal. There's a long siphon that comes up and it sucks up the sediment. And then this is the exhalant siphon where the excess water in the sediment is put out. So what we found was, at sites that had good densities of Macamona liliana, nutrient processing was maintained and the denitrification activity was maintained and those sediments had a good ability to get rid of those excess nutrients. And we know why this occurs, because we've been interested in the natural history of this animal. So this represents some work that was done with some collaborators um, from the United States at um, University of South Carolina. And it involved taking these animals into the lab and putting a very, very high resolution pressure sensor next to them. And what you can see in this particular time series over an hour is these periods of high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure and high pressure. What this represents is the animal pressurising the sediments. They take in water at the surface, they bring it down, they process the food on the gill, and then they eject water. Now this exhaling siphon is normally here at depth. So it's pumping oxygenated water down deep into these sediments. And this is the critical part about how it facilitates nutrient processing. So what we're having a look at here is a, a, is a side view through the sediment water interface. It's a false colour image, but it's showing you the distribution of oxygen. And you can see above the water column, there's plenty of oxygen, yellows and reds, and then this is the sediment water interface, and then this is the sediment beneath it. These are some trials taken from three species which essentially um, do the same thing. So what happens with these animals? So if you focus here on these purple blobs that are occurring here, this is the oxygenated water that's coming out of the exhaling siphon of these animals at depth. That oxygenated water facilitates the microbial community and that makes them more efficient at getting rid of nutrients and converting it into N2 gas. While they're pressurising the sediment, it's a little difficult to see, but you'll see these plumes of deoxygenated water coming up out of the sediment into the water column. That deoxygenated water, water without oxygen, has all the nutrients in it. So these animals in the sediments are literally flushing the sediments out through pressurising the sediment. They're also facilitating the microbial community to be better at denitrification. So what happens when you add a lot of nutrients? And we added a lot of nutrients. So biodiversity mattered, but it wasn't this particular key species because what happened when we added a lot of nutrients, it basically wiped out the Macamona community. So overall, the sediment's ability to process nitrogen was severely impaired because they'd lost this key species. Nevertheless, sites that had lots of different animals, lots of nutrient processes in it, still had a positive effect and provided some resilience or some ability to process those nutrients. So biodiversity matters, and different elements of biodiversity matter when the system is under low stress and when it's under high stress. Okay, so what does all this mean? Let's take a step back. So, we're living in New Zealand. We have relatively lucky, we have these relatively pristine estuaries with healthy seagrass communities and sediment. And we can end up, like many harbours and estuaries in Europe and North America, in these, muddy, in these muddy messes that have low diversity and low ecosystem values to most of society. So where are we along this continuum? Well, the question is, we don't really know. But we do know from our research that the biodiversity in animals that we have in these sediments provides resilience to change. So I like to use this little ball model in terms of describing ecosystem state and transitions between different states. Sand flat, mud flat, healthy ecosystem, 
macroalgal blooms. So when the ecosystem's healthy, the system can be perturbed. You can knock this ball, you can add a flush of nutrients, and the system will continue to function and won't change into another state. You need to give it a pretty good nudge to get it down to some sort of altered state. Now what happens when we start reducing biodiversity, when we start stressing the system, is this hump, or this effort, this resilience to change begins to be eroded. So when we have a reduction in the abundance of shellfish in our harbours, when we begin to add mud that drops some species out, we're beginning to erode this resilience to change. Climate change, temperature stresses, nutrient pulses, sediment coming in, all begin to be eroded away. Until eventually, you might only need a very small perturbation to move it into an altered state. And then we could end up right down here in this degraded state, where to restore an ecosystem is incredibly difficult and hard to do. So the question is, where are we along the spectrum? The answer is, we probably don't really know. We're probably not here in this original state. We've seen changes in our estuaries and harbours associated with increasing sediments and nutrients. And we're certainly not down at this bottom state yet in many places as well. So the big questions become is, what do we need to move a system? You know, how sensitive are various systems to tipping into alternate states? How does the interaction between increasing nutrients and increasing mud content in sediments erode that resilience? So today, we and most researchers globally have been only focused on one stressor at a time. It simplifies our world. We deal with sediments, we go and do a sediment study. We do a nutrients, we go and do a nutrient study. What we don't do is think about, well, what are the combined effects of these two stresses? If we add sediment, then we probably degraded the biodiversity a bit. Is those sediments more prone to a tipping point or shifting into alternate states? And this is the focus of our research coming up as part of the Sustainable Seas Challenge. We have a large program where we're going to be going out into estuaries throughout the country, adding nutrients to sediments again, but combining this with turbidity stress and light stress and mud content. And it involves a cast of thousands, but we'll be coming to an estuary near you, hopefully. So this is, what's, this is where we're heading in the future to understand it. And what's happening in the New Zealand landscape is that on land, we're managing often for one stressor. We're managing for nutrient loading. You can only have this much nutrients going into a river or this much sediment. And secondly, we're not thinking about the downstream effects. So what might be good for one stream or one river, by the time you apply that over an entire catchment, the cumulative effects downstream in the receiving environments in our harbours and estuaries could be quite catastrophic. And we need to get this right. Not only are we managing for our future and setting these limits and understanding about how these ecosystems work, but these ecosystems are connected over vast differences. And I'd like to finish with this little example here of the migrating godwits. We all enjoy these birds in our estuaries and harbours. They've just left in uh, March for their journey up through um, Asia to their breeding grounds um, in Alaska, and they'll be reaching um, Alaska around about this time of the year. And then in September, they'll be back down into New Zealand to feed on the sand flats at Miranda and the Firth of Thames, for example. So management decisions we're making here, where the estuaries are becoming more degraded, will affect the food supply of these birds. It will determine their success of reaching Alaska and their breeding success once they get there. So, these ecosystems are connected over very, very large distances. We're not managing just for ourselves, or understanding just for ourselves. They're connected over very, very large differences. Okay, I think that's about it. So obviously, what I presented today is work of graduate students and colleagues, um, and I've been phenomenally lucky um, over the last uh, 12 for some uh, wonderful students. Every, every single one of them I've, I've learned an immense amount from. And I'm not going to name them, it's like children, you can't have a favourite, um, but you know who you are. Um, the, 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 the technical support, in particular, um, Dudley Bell and, and Peter Jarman in the Electronics Workshop have been phenomenal, and none of this would have been possible without them. A great team of collaborators, Simon Thrush, Judy Hewitt at Niwa, um, Drew Laura and Carolyn Longquist, and uh, colleagues overseas, Alf Morco, Sally Wooden and Dave Weathy. And particular thanks, I think, um, deserves to go to the School of Science and the University of Waikato and um, Alan Green for appointing someone who never had a PhD. I promise I'll get it done. 
Um, so I appreciate that and they've allowed me to be and supported me with equipment and facilities that um, I second to none and I really appreciate that. Funders of course, uh, Marsden, MB, um, regional councils, ports, companies, etc. And finally, uh, my family, um, they have to put up with me the most and um, uh, I thank you all and uh, I'd like to review that slide. Most people are in there, so thanks very much. gentlemen, Tenakotu uh, Katoa. It's my task to sum up uh, and thank Conrad for what has been a wonderful talk. Tonight's was a compelling case for why we should care about one of the most ubiquitous environments on the planet, soft bottoms. Yeah. Um, as an aspiring marine scientist growing up in California, I fondly recall the opportunities I had to learn about marine biodiversity. I also recall that I enjoyed the rugged open coast, um, the rocky shoreline. I avoided soft sediments at every opportunity, largely because I never mastered that opportunity to walk on mud. Um, instead, I always had that sinking feeling, which makes working in these environments a particular challenge. And in fact, undertaking research in these environments a very compelling uh, case. Conrad, you've shared the questions that drive you and the extent to which land use alters coastal function and created a sense of urgency uh, with the audience and certainly in the New Zealand context. You've replaced butterflies with bivalves and hurricanes with shorebirds, which is quite an act. Um, we appreciate the contributions you're making here at the University of Waikato and to the New Zealand science community. I'd like to, uh, you all to join me in thanking Conrad uh, for his talk tonight and sharing those, those elements. And join us in the foyer to ask those pressing questions about soft bottoms that I'm sure you've all saved up. Um, please join me in thanking Conrad.